Live from Studio 46, the Democratic primary debate for New York City Comptroller. Sponsored by WCBS TV, WLNY, WCBS News Radio 880, 1010 Wins, Common Cause New York, and El Diario La Prensa. Here is your moderator, Marsha Kramer. Good evening and welcome to tonight's Democratic primary election debate for New York City Comptroller. The Comptroller is the chief financial officer for the city. The job includes auditing city agencies and managing its five pension funds, which total $137 billion. We bring you tonight's debate in cooperation with the New York City Campaign Finance Board. These debates are designed to hold the candidates accountable. It is a rare opportunity for you to see and hear the major candidates side by side, unfiltered and live. This debate is part of the city's official debate program for the 2013 elections, administered by the New York City Campaign Finance Board. The CFB administers the city's landmark public matching fund program, which further strengthens the role of average New Yorkers and their small dollar contributions in city elections. The nonpartisan objective criteria for this debate were set months in advance. Well, two quick program notes. You can also see tonight's debate in Spanish on WLNY TV 55. And you can join the debate discussion online by tweeting hashtag NYC debates. We want to welcome now the two Democrats in the running for controller, former New York Governor Elliot Spitzer, Manhattan Borough President Scott Stringer. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you. And joining me tonight to question the candidates, Rich Lamb from CBS News Radio 880 and Marlene Peralta, she's a reporter for El Diario. Um, here are the ground rules. There are no opening statements. Candidates will have one minute to answer each question and they will have 30 seconds for rebuttal. By coin toss, Mr. Spitzer gets the first question and it will be asked by Rich Lamb. This question is for both of you. You are running to become the chief financial officer, the CFO of New York City. What is the city government's biggest waste of money right now, and how would you go about fixing it? Rich, it's a great question. Before I get to that, and I will very specifically, I want to thank CBS for doing and hosting this debate, and Time Warner for agreeing to put it on air. I want to make another point. Time Warner and CBS should get together. Lots of people are watching tonight, I hope. A lot more probably want to watch football in a couple weeks. Back in 03 and 05, when I was Attorney General, I mediated to get the Mets and the Yankees back on Cablevision and Time Warner. Please, CBS and Time Warner, find a mediator who can help you bridge this chasm. Mr. Spitzer, Lots of people you have 30 can. seconds left. I will tell you, $400 million in fees is being wasted rich every year that we pay to those who manage our pension dollars and we get a substandard return. Bring the management of those assets in-house. We will do it better if you elect somebody who understands the capital markets, somebody who can manage money, who can make the hard determinations about where to put that, that, that capital so we get a better return, protect the pensions, invest in the city's future. We will save $400 million. That is precisely what the controller should do. Well, I'm very glad to be here as well. Let me also mention a proposal we issued this week. It's called ClaimStat. Right now, the city is paying out $650 million in claims because people are suing the city. We have to change that. The reality is that we have to come up with a protocol that's actually going to reduce claims. And my proposal is to do what we're doing in LA and Portland, which is to go analyze where the claims are coming from. Right now, the NYPD has a huge number of claims, people suing the NYPD because of stop and frisk and other issues. As controller, I'm going to examine where those claims are coming from to reduce payments so we can pay more money for schools, for daycare centers. This is the kind of work the controller should be doing, keeping an eye on city finances and coming up with creative programs to make a difference for the city. Mr. Stringer, thank you very much for answering the question. The next question will go for Marlene Peralta. Yes, and this question is also for the both of you. Uh, former state controller Alan Hevesy went to jail for giving huge contracts to his friends to provide investment advice. What rules will you institute to prevent similar corruption and abuse in New York City? Mr. Stringer, you go first. Well, as a member of the uh, NYSERS pension fund for seven and a half years, I was the first trustee to say that we should ban the use of placement agents. There's no place in our pension system for people to use political connections to game the system. That's the job of controller, to make sure that this office has the highest level of integrity, that I'm going to use my experience and leadership to make sure that we create a level playing field for everybody. Sure, investments, Growing the fund is critically important, 
but the way you do it is almost as, as important. I have a record of reform in Albany. I have a record of reform as Manhattan Borough President. I've been a transparent elected official. And I have always comported myself, whether I've been a state legislator or Manhattan Borough President, with the highest level of professionalism. There will be no drama from me. People will know early on that there will be nothing that they can game in the controller's office because the rules I will set on day one will be to the highest standards. And that's the way I've always done it. Mr. I think we would all agree, obviously, there needs to be not only transparency, but there needs to be a decision process that will be based upon the integrity of the investment, the return to the investors, protecting the pensions, and making sure that we have somebody as controller who understands the capital markets. That is why we need to elect a controller who's been active in the capital markets, somebody who has confronted the corruption on Wall Street, who knows where the games are being played. That is precisely why my record as Attorney General, where I alone, for years, stood up to the cataclysm that was brewing on Wall Street that cost us $14 trillion. I, ref I showed the public I understood what Wall Street was doing, where the games are played, how they will fleece us. We need to elect somebody who has that learning immediately. Let me very quickly respond to your point, Scott, about claims. We would not have had many of those claims about stop and frisk if we had not had a mayor who had a third term, a third term you gave him. Stop and frisk would have been reformed years ago. All the claims you're talking about are a consequence of giving a mayor a third term through a backroom political deal that you, as part of the political establishment, were part of. That's where those claims came from. Mr. Stringer, rebuttal. You were more out of touch than I thought you were. No one thinks that I gave him a third term. But here's the facts, Elliot. I don't think that we should limit terms. I've felt this way for 20 years, having nothing to do with term limits now. You term limited yourself. And when you term limited yourself by resigning, look what happened. Chaos ensued. And part of what we have to recognize is we need a stable government. I'll tell you who fought to end the Bloomberg third term. It was me, because I was working to make sure that Bill Thompson was elected mayor. I walked the streets. I contributed. With all, with um, your, you could, didn't even, you didn't even spend $175 and give him a campaign contribution. What's even more incredible is you didn't work for Thompson, Mr. Stringer, and you didn't vote for Obama. Up. OK, the next question goes to Mr. Spitzer. Mr. Spitzer, you were an assistant district attorney. You also served as attorney general. I'm curious, if you'd been presented with the same fact set involving Empress Club, number, uh, Empress Club VIP and client number nine, which was yourself, would you have filed any charges? No, I would have done precisely what, of course, I was not. I would have done what the federal government did. They investigated. They determined no charges were going to be filed. That is what they determined based upon a full examination of the evidence. And I think that speaks for itself, and that is the conclusion they reached. Mr. Stringer, would you like to rebut that? The job of controller is so important. It's a matter of the public trust. You are safeguarding the retirement security of 650,000 individuals, half in the system, and soon half will be. The fact that we can even ask a candidate for controller about being client number nine speaks to the issue of credibility in the capital markets during the pension meetings. This election is about giving someone a seat when he violated the trust of the people in his last office. Spitzer gets elected. We basically have given a get out of jail uh, card to all the people who come after him who said, well, he got away Mr. with Stringer, it. Why time, can't I? Time is up. Mr. Spitzer, would you like to rebut that? Yes, just merely very simply. I think credibility in the capital markets is, in fact, what this campaign is about. The job is to be the fiscal officer, as Marsha said at the very beginning, of the city of New York who understands the capital markets, who stood up to Wall Street, who alone was able to reveal the fissures, the frailties, the structural flaws that cost America $14 trillion. That's the number the Federal Reserve Bank gave us. That is what we need, somebody who can invest, somebody who understands Wall Street, somebody who has a record of standing up to Wall Street time and time again. Well, Mr. Stringer, you keep citing your experience on the pension boards while you were Manhattan Borough President. But I'm curious, what percentage of the meetings that were held did you personally attend? And it is, a good, is it a good practice to send underlings to make decisions on pension funds that are worth billions of dollars? It's a good question. Uh, I believe I'm the only borough president who's actually attended the meetings of the NICERS board, especially in my first term, so I could learn the players, meet the individuals who would be making these important decisions, and work with the controller. So I'm proud of my role. I took but it very seriously. But how many seriously. did you attend? I think 
over the time, over four years, a number of meetings, you know, 20, 30, 15, you know, whatever. I don't have the specific amount of time. It's been seven and a half years but since I've been on the fund. But I put together a staff working with me that worked on many of these issues. And I think I've done a very good job working with the other trustees to make sure we meet our actuarial targets and work hard at this issue. Mr. Spitzer, in 2007, there was a published report that said you went to three of 21 meetings, which would mean that you were absent 85% of the time. And we've also found records of, of uh, board meetings and minutes from 2011 that show that you sent an assistant named Jimmy Land. So I'm, yeah, Jimmy Yan, I'm wondering if you thought that, that that was appropriate number of times to appear, and if you really think that it's good to send an underling to make those kinds of decisions. The borough president is, is uh, represented by legal counsel. Jimmy Yand is my counsel. He's one of the most effective trustees on the board, someone who takes his role very seriously. We have done a lot of work on the, trend, uh, on the fund, working on emerging manager issues, thinking about issues of climate change. I've attended way more than three meetings, Marsha. I think that's an error. We'll certainly get to the updated information. But it is appropriate to do that kind of work. Look, a lot of people, when Elliot's attorney general, I can't imagine how many times he actually appeared in court. Uh, this is the way you manage an office. You manage the NICERS fund. I manage the land use department in my office. I manage the policy unit. And I think by all accounts, I have comported myself as a uh, Manhattan Borough President uh, in a way that I think speaks to my integrity and effectiveness. Mr. Spitzer, would you like to rebut? Well, merely uh, to this point, I think that NICERS has underperformed. And I think it is important whether you attend, but I'll let others who have the records sort that out. I, I don't know the answer to that question, Scott, but I will tell you this. When NICERS has underperformed in the past number of years to the tune of billions of dollars, th those are billions of dollars that we will need to put into a fund that we would not have needed to put in if performance had been better. Performance was not good because the leadership was inadequate. The leadership was inadequate because people weren't paying attention. When I was attorney general, we saved investors billions of dollars. Just one example, in mutual funds where we drove down the fees to investors so you were able to put money in your pocket instead of sending it to mutual up. fund companies. Sorry. Okay, the next question from Marlene. Yes, this question is also for the both of you. Um, since high pension costs help break the back of Detroit and have put Chicago in bad economic shape, going forward, can New York City afford to give its workers pension? We can start with Mr. Spitzer. Well, first, let's be very clear. New York is not Detroit. New York is not Chicago. Detroit had a very different dynamic. It had a one industry foundation for its economy, the auto industry. When the auto industry left Detroit and moved elsewhere in the nation and overseas, it lost the tax base. It lost hundreds of thousands of residents. And as a consequence, Detroit imploded. And so its economic model is very different than New York City's, where we are a dynamic, organic economic entity. Thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people flowing into the city. We are the intellectual capital, the financial capital. We are increasingly the capital for intellectual, cultural, educational institutions. So yes, we have a so very Mr. different... Spencer, can we afford it? Can we yes, afford we can. pensions? Yes, we can. Of course we can afford pensions. We can and we must. That is the contract. That is the deal we have cut with our workers in government. We pay them pensions that they negotiate for. Do we have to be wise, as I was when I was government governor, in negotiating what those pensions are? Of course. But yes, we owe them the pensions. We will pay them. The we will up, negotiate them fairly. Mr. Stringer? Well, I, too, believe that our workers deserve pensions. They do dedicate their lives to the city. Many work for very little money, but really keep our city running. But here's the issue that we have to face economically. The truth is our pension costs are spiraling. In 2001, pension contributions from the city into the fund was $1.2 Today, it's close to $9 billion. Our health care costs are totally spiraling. So the next mayor has to collectively bargain with labor unions in a way that gets us to what we can afford, but also to recognize our limitations. The job of controller is critically important here. I'm going to be an arbiter of what we can do, but also to pull back and recognize what we can't do. I believe that when you look at the finances and you look at in Detroit and Chicago, Elliot's right. We're certainly not Detroit. 800,000 people are coming to the city. We're not leaving. We're not shifting out 700,000 people. But it is a warning that we have to constitute a government where you have people who are experienced, who are steady hands. We're not trying to settle old scores. Someone who can look and examine where we are as it relates to our Mr. pension Jr., obligations. Your time is up. And that's what I'm going to do as controller. Mr. Lamb, your next question. And that's for Mr. Stringer. Uh, you have repeatedly said that Mr. Spitzer laundered money. Yet the U.S. attorney at the time said that there was no evidence of money laundering and that he could not charge Mr. Spitzer. Is it fair and accurate for you to accuse him of money laundering when the U.S. attorney explicitly declined to prosecute on that charge for lack of evidence? 
Uh, well, I stand by my statements. Uh, Elliot Spitzer broke many laws. He admitted it himself. The fact that we're even having a discussion about an ex-governor who resigned because he was part of a criminal, federal criminal probe and now he's running to be the chief banker of the city when he absolutely tried to segregate payments to avoid federal detection. His own bank dropped a dime on him and now he thinks he has the credibility to be the chief banker. There's just something wrong with that. You know, while he was going through his issues, I was actually opening up bank accounts for people who had uh, economic issues in our city. I started Bank on Manhattan. I created a financial tool working with the FDIC and six other banks so that we can help our people get the financial credit that they need to go forward. That's the difference between us. He keeps talking about whether it's bank, you know, whether it's bank fraud, whether it's money laundering. You know what? This was wrong. What's good is I spent a lifetime trying to make it a little easier for the working people, the city, and the middle class. And I stand by my arguments and my reasoning. The time is up, and it's now time to ask Mr. Spitzer if he wants to rebut. The only to say this, Marsh, and I appreciate the question. I made mistakes. I've been very forthright about that, but I made a difference. And that is what I'm asking the public to consider and weigh the totality of my career. When I took on Wall Street, Mr. Stringer was on the sidelines. When I stood up to the big banks that cost us $14 trillion, when I protected low-wage workers, Mr. Stringer was giving our mayor a third term. When I stood up on stop and frisk in 1999, investigating the first report to genuinely examine this very important issue, Mr. Stringer was giving our mayor a third term. So the difference between us is, yes, I fought big battles. I've won some, I've lost some. Mr. I made a mistake, but I've made a difference. Uh, Mr. Stringer, did you want to respond to that? Well, you, you didn't make that much of a difference because when you resigned as Governor Elliott, you left Governor Patterson with a $23 billion budget deficit and you walked away. And then, for the last five years, we, could, we haven't seen or heard from you. You've missed every issue facing this city. You've been in your ivory tower while the rest of us have been grappling with the economic issues that have spoken to the problems that the city faces. You were nowhere to be found during Hurricane Sandy. I was down in the Lower East Side. We were trying to help, help people. And you were being a $2 million commentator on CNN criticizing the, the work we were up, doing. Mr. That's Mr. not Stringer. right. Look, well, let me just say this, Scott. Repeating falsehoods doesn't make them true, even if you repeat them over and over. Where you come up with these numbers about budgets, I don't know. I passed a balanced budget working with a legislature that gave historic funding to New York City's education, reformed health care, did many other things we can talk about. We are proud of that budget. We passed it with the legislature. Now, over the last five years, I taught at CCNY. Yes, I was on CNN as a commentator. I helped friends after Sandy. Many people did many important things individually, collectively, those in government, those not in government. I think we should appreciate that fact and be thankful to all of them. Okay, this next question is to both of you. Should certain vices like marijuana, prostitution, and gambling be legalized and taxed to help the city coffers the way they are in many other cities and states? And this first question goes to Mr. Spitzer. Well, let's deal with decriminalization of marijuana. That is the one I think that has had the greatest traction. And I think, yes, we have moved towards decriminalization of marijuana. And I think eventually we will go towards full legalization, not only in the medical what about context. Taxing it? And then once it's legal, of course, it can be taxed. And so you then get the revenue. I think there's a fair debate within the law enforcement community, within sociologists, among those who've studied the issue, whether or not we want to permit additional access to marijuana. We're beginning to do that, as we should. In the medical context, I think over time it will be legalized and taxed. Yes. Mr. Stringer. I support uh, decriminalization of marijuana. I think that's part of the whole stop and frisk debate, and I'm glad that it's now been ruled uh, unconstitutional. I now want to focus on what the economy really is about. We have to think about creating jobs in the high-tech community. I'm not sure legalization for prostitution and marijuana is really on my agenda. It's not. We should think about how we can create the next gateway to the middle class. High-tech jobs have grown 60% in the last 10 years, but our kids can't access those jobs because we spend so much time teaching to the test rather than teaching to a job that leads to a career. This is the way we're going to grow the economy, by thinking about how we elevate small businesses. Stop taxing and fining them and give them a roadmap to success. The next controller, as a chief fiscal officer, has to be in the neighborhoods, in the streets, thinking about ways to grow the economy. So with all due respect, these are issues that I think will not get us to where we have to be for a 21st century economy. We have to think about the big way to grow our, uh, to grow our city, and I think I have some very strong proposals in that area. Well, neither one of you has actually answered the question, so I'm going to repeat it. Should certain vices like marijuana, which, by the way, the 
controller of the city of New York says could raise a loan four hundred million dollars of taxes, prostitution and gambling be legalized and taxed to help our city coffers. No, no, and no. Well, well, no, I, I, I prostitution we, and uh, no, I think I, I answered already with respect about to marijuana. prostitution, no, but gambling already is legal and taxed. I mean, we have an entire system in the state of New York, whether you call the lottery or our casinos, we already do that. Marijuana, I said explicitly yes. Let me just make one very quick point in rebuttal. Scott loves to challenge the education policies in the city of New York, and rightly so. The problem is the education policies, again, are a consequence of a third term, a third term where the numbers of, in, in our educational performance have dropped precipitously because we had a third term with a mayor who did not listen to the critics who said we needed to change course. The third term here is the problem. And Elliot, I wish you would have joined us in that campaign to stop him from having a third term. I wish you had actually gone to a community meeting. I wish you would work with some of the candidates for mayor who were supporting me who fought that third term. Nobody who wanted to prevent Mike Bloomberg from having a third term is supporting you. So you're taking an argument that you had nothing to do with, you did not participate, and now, because you're looking at your poll numbers, you need an issue in the last few weeks, so what do we do? Let's blame Scott Stringer for the third term. It's laughable. Look who's endorsing me because of my record. The New York Times, the Daily News, the New York Post, the Amsterdam News, the people who okay. speak to my credibility. Your time is up, Mr. Stringer. <laughs> And now we've come can to... I, can I respond to that yes, briefly? You can. Go ahead. Again, I don't know what poll numbers you're looking at, but I think the last poll numbers that were reported publicly had me up by 19 and 18 points. The poll numbers come I look at here. parenthetically, the poll numbers, well, let's be accurate, though, Mr. Stringer. As I said, repeating facts that are false doesn't make them true. You pulled out today, you didn't see. Scott, 19 and 18 was the margin by which I was up. The point here is that the poll that I care about is in the street. And when I'm in the street, people know I'm independent, I'm a fighter, I've stood up for them, and that's why they're supportive. So now we've come to the part of our, our evening where you each get to ask each other a question. Mr. Stringer, you go first. So, Elliot, uh, there was a newspaper report today that some of your uh, um, in investments are in the Cayman Islands uh, offshore accounts. This is uh, accounts that sometimes you railed, uh, rip, not, rip, I'm sorry, Mitt Romney about and <coughs> other corporate uh, leaders about putting money in the Cayman Islands. Uh, don't you think it's now time to release all five years of your tax returns because we should get a broader picture of how you invest your money because you're trying to invest our money and I think this is the time now to release all five years as I have done uh, in the beginning of the campaign. Okay, the, the Scott, quick, actually glad you asked this question but once again it shows that you repeat things that are simply false. They're not my investments, they're the investments of a foundation that has been created by my parents that has given over 30 million dollars away to CCNY to the Museum of Natural History, to teach evolution, mm -hmm. to the public theater. Absolutely. This is a success story. A success story, my dad who grew up with nothing, no hot water. He's built buildings, he worked hard in a city that gave him opportunity. He went to CCNY, which is why his name is now on the architecture building there, because the foundation has pledged $25 million. It's to not see. a question about Mr. Dad. Stringer, please not do not interrupt. Please do not you. interrupt, sir. Okay, a little. You have maligned my dad's foundation, and my dad, <laughs> let me answer the question. This foundation, and they're not my investments, has generated millions of dollars for charities. It has been audited. It is pristine. It is perfect. It does everything. It pays every penny in taxes. It should. Now, my taxes. Let's talk about my taxes, since you wanted to raise them. I paid 49% in my tax returns last year, 39.5% the year before. I paid more than most people I know. The issue with Mitt Romney, Scott, was that he paid, he said, about 10%, and he hid his personal income overseas. The foundation, and if you read the article, it said the foundation does what every foundation does, invest in vehicles that are designed for foundations that are tax-free, so we can give away millions of dollars every year to great cultural institutions in the city of New York. I'm proud of the success my dad had. I'm proud of the success the foundation has had. I'm proud of what that foundation does for this great city. And that gets, and that gets to, to standards of justice because you tell Mitt Romney to release his taxes, but you won't release your taxes, and we've been playing hide-and-seek with yours. We talk about uh, the Cayman Islands and offshore accounts. You hold other people to that account, to that standard, but you're not willing to do that for yourself. So I just want to keep bringing up, Elliot, that you seem to operate with one set of rules, and you expect the rest of us to operate differently. And I just think it's not fair you know, when you want to represent the people of this city, the people who have to play by the rules that some rich and powerful people give them. And we we got to change that you in know, this election. But can I simply respond? Because again, 
repeating a falsehood doesn't make it true. I was a lawyer in a courtroom. We had to prove and bring evidence to bear, which is why we got convictions and changed the way things were done on Wall Street and elsewhere. Scott, our first debate, you said the same thing about not having released tax returns, and I said, no, that's false. They've been released. Mm -hmm. Come look at them. You haven't shown up. You said you would send them to me. You want them in the mail, Scott? No. I said, come look at them, because every journalist who has wanted to has come and examined them, every page. And they've seen that I paid 49% of my income in taxes. Now, Scott, I'm proud to pay those taxes, because it funds the educational system, our subways, our schools. But I paid 49%. My tax returns have been released. And you can repeat over and over that they haven't been. It doesn't make it true. But, Mr. Spitzer, now you get the opportunity to ask a question of Mr. Stringer. Thank you. Scott, you love to talk about NYCHA, the failures at NYCHA. You examined the elevators. But here's the question. If you had not participated with a political elite that, again, gave our mayor a third term, the mayor runs NYCHA. You have loved to rail about the fact that money has not been invested at NYCHA. The mayor who proposed fingerprinting the residents of NYCHA. None of that would have happened if you hadn't gone out and supported a third term. And you can try to claim that you went out and then voted for Billy Thompson and campaigned with him once or twice. But you testified before the city council and you said you believed a third term was necessary. This was a deal by insiders to protect their own jobs so they wouldn't need to run at a moment when they didn't want to run against each other. Given everything you've said about NYCHA, don't you wish there had been a different mayor and not a third term for Mike Bloomberg in charge of NYCHA all these years? Well, if you had helped me elect a Democratic mayor, that probably would have happened. But the truth I is... I wish I were that powerful, Scott. But, well, I wish I was that influential as you think I was. I'm not a member of the city council, and you know that. But I understand that you have to say this. But let's talk about NYCHA because it's actually a very good question. The substance of your question is important. So when I was in the state assembly, I blew the whistle on the fact that NYCHA housing was actually warehousing apartments, even though there was a 100,000 person waiting list, and we fought to make changes. I was the one, as you correctly stated, that went through every elevator inspection report at NYCHA and found that elevators fail 75% of the time. And then we worked with Chuck Schumer to bring $500 million in federal stimulus money to NYCHA and redirected priorities. Just this past year, Elliot, I issued a report that said we gotta stop the patronage and the, the governance structure at NYCHA. And you know what I did? I issued the report, but then I did something you could never do while you was governor. I went to Albany and worked collaboratively to pass NYCHA reform and change the governance structure. There is no other elected official running for office who has this 20-year record. I'm glad that you finally showed up at a NYCHA development, one of the ones I've visited many times. I think it's good for you to see how other people live, how other people struggle. And that's the difference between Mr. us. Stringer, I've been out in the streets up. trying to solve real problems while you've been in the ivory tower. <laughs> Um, Mr. Scott, Spitzer, Scott, I think you'd like to respond. First, let me say this. I don't live in an ivory tower. I have struggled. I've worked hard. I've worked no, very hard as an assistant district attorney, a prosecutor, the attorney general, the governor. And in fact, when I was governor, you praised my record on housing. You said nobody in Albany in years had come close to doing as much for public housing. We not only invested, we created funds to build, we restored. I was the one whom you praised when I was governor because you said nobody had shown the leadership the expertise, and the interest in public housing. I will not defer to anybody in terms of a dedication to this most central and critical piece of the infrastructure for our city. Okay, well, the next question is for both of you. Now, you're both running on your records of service in Albany, and you both have worked with Assembly Speaker Sheldon Silver. Given the rash of charges of sexual harassment cases, cases that involve taxpayer dollars, taxpayer dollars that were spent on settlements and legal fees, should Sheldon Silver resign, or should members of the Assembly vote to replace him? Uh, Mr. Stringer, I think you can go first. Uh, I was the second elected official to call on Vito Lopez to resign immediately. Uh, Congressman Jerry Nadler, a supporter of mine, was the first. I'm very troubled with the allegations in Albany. That was Lopez. I was asking you I'm, if... I'm answering the question. I okay. wanted to show my record. Uh, I believe that come the Democratic conference, the members should seriously consider uh, whether to keep the speaker pending a full investigation. That investigation is happening now, but we can have zero tolerance uh, given the issues here. It's under, uh, there's an investigation going on, but I do think this raises serious ethical issues. Should Shelley Silver resign? Depending the outcome of an investigation uh, that shows that he may have engaged in wrongful activity, 
you have to have the same standard for the speaker as you would to Elliot Spitzer. When Elliot Spitzer did something wrong, the federal government came to him. He had to resign. Everyone has to be held to that same standard. Mr. Spitzer. Uh, let, let me be very simple about this. The members of the assembly should elect a new speaker right now. This, the assembly is ossified. It is broken. It is too rigid. There's capacity for new and creative leadership in the assembly. It's time for action. Mr. Stringer, did you want to rebut that? Okay, the next question will be from Rich Lamb. And this question is for you both. Uh, it's, uh, listen carefully, all right? We would, would you audit the relationship between political donations made by the real estate industry and developers and the tax abatements they receive, which deprive the city of $1.1 billion in revenues. Mr. Spitzer? Absolutely. And in fact, I think those political contributions, which are now being hidden and funneled through all sorts of vehicles, some not-for-profits, which have been styling themselves as lobbying organizations and 501c4s, should all be revealed. There are huge funds up in Albany that were gathered in the past several years under different names where the donors have not yet been revealed. They should all be revealed. It's about time that it happens. But I think this is symptomatic of the way the Midtown zoning proposal was just rushed through, again, at the end of the mayor's third term, a bad idea without adequate review. Scott, my opponent, was, came out for it. I think that was wrong. It did not consider the appropriateness of the size and scale of the buildings that will be proposed in the context of the infrastructure that is needed. Many, many flaws in that, in that system and in that zoning decision. And again, I think there as well, you have to examine the flow of money that influenced these decisions. Mr. Stringer? Yeah, it's, it's really great that uh, Elliot just came charging into the Midtown rezoning proposal. I guess I must have missed him at the community board meeting. I didn't see him testify at the city planning commission. He never called me up and said, hey, buddy, I have some good ideas for this issue. In fact, I haven't heard him talk about a city government issue since he resigned as governor. But here's what we were able to do in Midtown rezoning and with other large land use issues I've had to tackle. I helped build build out three university expansions, but I've also made sure the community was protected. I've worked on these issues because I built a professional land use staff. We've gotten accolades from community-based organizations and the community because we also initiated community-based community board reform where we went to a merit-based selection to pick community board members to have more diverse opinions at the table. By any measure, People have praised my office because we engage the community in all these issues. You could have applied to the community board because it was certainly open to you, and I would have appointed you if you came out of our screening panel. Well, I, I appreciate that, that and then uh, endorsement. Talk, and you could have talked honestly about these well, well, issues. I, thank you. I, I appreciate that. But let me be very clear. The question was about Midtown zoning and the flow of money. You supported Midtown zoning despite the fact that you testified in, in a way that was ambiguous. You ended up supporting it. It's a bad plan. It was rushed through. There was inadequate review. It was a cave to developers. You don't and this the, is what. No, you, don't know, this, let me, you don't know the land use process, so I'd be happy to I, well, straighten you out on that. Well, I, I appreciate that offer. We will maybe go over my tax returns at the same time. You can edify You're me on that. You're more than welcome to right. come over. Okay, wonderful. I look forward to it. We'll, we'll do it over coffee. I think that would be helpful. That midtown zoning was a bad idea, improperly conceived, improperly approved. Scott was for it. Okay, the next question is from Marlene. This question is for Mr. Spitzer. When you were Attorney General, you were described as the moral crusader going after the bad guys on Wall Street. You disappointed many when you resigned because of your prostitution scandal. What role does personal morality, morality, morality play in public service? I appreciate the question, and of course it plays a role. It plays an important role. And I know I disappointed many people, and that's when I, why I've said repeatedly that I have seen peaks and valleys in my career. The view from the top of the peaks is wonderful. It's at the bottom in the valleys that you learn much more. I've asked the public in this race to weigh and balance the totality of my career. And I've asked them to weigh and balance what I did when I was Attorney General, when I was Governor, when I was Assistant District Attorney, what I've done as a teacher, even on CNN, which Scott may or may not have approved of. I have taken these jobs very seriously, and I'm asking the public to think about what I've done and balance. I said I've made mistakes, but I made a difference. And I'm asking the public to consider the fact that having made mistakes and learned from them, I've also made a difference, will continue to try to make a difference as an independent voice will stand up and fight for them when others have not been willing to do so. That's why I'm seeking this position. Mr. Spitzer, though, I don't think you answered her specific question, which is what role does morality play in public service? Plays a huge role. I, 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 I'm sorry, I thought I did at the top when I said, of course it plays a role. Plays a central role. How? How? Because the public must evaluate an individual and vote for somebody. I'm asking to be the CFO, the chief financial officer of a city. But I also need to have the trust of the public. I appreciate that. 
And I've gone back to the public and sought that trust. And what I've seen in the streets is a public that says, yes, we are willing to give you that chance because we think and believe that you learned, that you have sought redemption. You have fought for us. You fought hard. You won battles, you lost battles. We always fought for us. And on that basis, the public is looking for the, to the totality of my career and is willing to be supportive. Mr. Stringer. This campaign is about who we trust to manage a $140 billion pension fund, to audit city agencies with great credibility. Part of what this battle is about is the future of the middle class and those aspiring to get there. There are so many families that are struggling after the hurricane. I saw this firsthand in Coney Island and Breezy Point, places that were so devastated. I've offered a Sandy unit in the controller's office, a special unit that's going to make sure that we watch the $15 billion in federal money that's coming through our city agencies. I want to be laser focused on that. I want to figure out ways to bring the pension funds closer together, work with 58 trustees so we can lower administrative costs that could save us up to a billion dollars. I want to use that savings to build out our schools and to help our people. Every office I've held, it has been about trust, it has been about honesty. It has been about making sure that I do the people's business. And I think the only way you can make a judgment on which candidate to support is just compare the records. I will never embarrass this community, the city of New York that I love. I will never let you down. I'm not running because I have to clear my name. I'm running because I want to build the next generation of leadership in this city, and I want to do it in a way that's going to engage the diverse city that we love. That's why the Times, Daily News and Post, Amsterdam News is supporting me. That's why NOW and NARAL and Planned Parenthood, all these progressive groups who, in, who look at candidates and make a decision. Mr. Uh, I would, well, not so much a rebuttal, just an observation. I'm running to serve. That's what my career has been. As a prosecutor, as an assistant district attorney, as attorney general, as governor, I served the public. And when I say to the public and I speak to voters and I ask them if they want me to come back, they say, yes, please, fight for us. Be the independent voice who fought for us. We trust you. We know you sinned. We know you made a mistake. Many of us have. But you learn from it, and we know you will fight for us. I made a mistake, but I fight to make a difference, and that's why the public, which is the only endorsement I need, is supportive. Mr. Lamb. This is a question for both of you. Uh, it's a short one. <laughs> what, what creative thing would you do with the city's money to get a maximum return? Mr. Stringer, we'll start with you. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, you looked at you. Um, well, part of, what we've got to, part of what we've got to do is beat our actuarial targets, but I would like to rely on the side of caution. I believe that we can get to our targets by also making sure we have a differential asset allocation. It's very important that we have a, an investment that also considers the risk of different investments. Right now, we learned from the uh, last economic storm that we lost so much of our equity position that I think we have to grow slowly and carefully. We have a good mix right now. The pension fund this past year is now at 12.4% return. It doesn't mean that's going to happen next year. But rather than try to strike gold, I think we have to build out the Asset Management Bureau. Elliot's right, we have to lower the $400 million in fees we're paying uh, wealthy managers. But in order to do that, we have to bring people into our office that can save the money and, as w and also consider pension consolidation. These are the issues I'm going to work on. Well, compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. You do not invest to swing for the fences. If you do, you get economic cataclysm. I'm glad that Scott referred to the economic cataclysm that cost us the $14 trillion. Some of us were saying to Wall Street, you are driving over the cliff. Stop. Put on the brakes. I was one of those who looked at the structures and said they're dangers. Now, the way to save the money, Richard, is to save the $400 million that we're giving in fees to get a return that is inadequate. The inadequate return during the period that Scott was on the board has cost us billions of dollars. Save the $400 million, invest wisely, with caution, with somebody who understands capital markets. We will not only save the 400, we'll get a better return. A study that just came out, the Maryland Public Policy Institute, found across the nation there's an inverse relationship between the fees you pay and the return you get. Save the fees, invest wisely, compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. Just, uh, just to follow up if we can, what about the idea of uh, using money of city retirees for investing in affordable housing? Is that? Oh, look, I'm, I'm all for that, but your, your question I thought was how to yeah, save is. money, how to save money. Now, I believe, that as a creative concept, I've been talking about that for a long time. 
again, not to get into the, to the weeds about the particular investments, but few investments have been better over many generations than residential housing in the city of New York. Why? We're a magnet for people. We have a structural shortage of housing. Take those pension dollars. Invest in construction. The unions who are co-trustees here would love this idea and sign on to it. It creates jobs, creates communities, creates return, it creates the infrastructure for the city. That is precisely why I've been talking about that idea since I got into this race. Mm -hmm. And Mr. for Stewart, years Mr. prior Stewart? to that. Let, let me just, because I serve, I'm, I'm have an advantage, I serve as a trustee, you don't. We actually do that kind of investing right now. But keep in mind that a good affordable housing uh, infrastructure investment is not going to see wild returns, right? It's a steady investment over a long period of time, and that also speaks to the asset allocation of the pension fund. You want to make sure that you have a varied uh, allocation because you hedge against when things are low and high, and, and a good uh, affordable housing investment is very important because it's something that we can look towards for 20, 30 years. Okay, and now for our lightning round. Do you ever take, did you ever take an accounting course, Mr. Stringer? Yes. Mr. Spitzer? Yes. Yeah. Uh, should we eliminate the penny, Mr. Stringer? Yes. Mr. Spitzer? Yes. Um, what's your favorite app, Mr. Stringer? Uh, the one that's the, my photo app for my kids. I have a thousand pictures on it. Um, Mr. Str Spitzer, what's your favorite app? The one my kids use to put music on my iPod, but they use it. I don't. Okay, what's your favorite stock, Mr. Stringer? Uh, Apple. Oh. Apple and Mr. S Mr. Spitzer. Facebook. It's been fascinating to watch. Okay. That's how I feel about Apple. It's interesting. So, last uh, lightning round question. Can you sing me your favorite song, even a few bars? Mr. Stringer. We can be heroes can just for one day. Can you sing it for me? I just did. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. Bowie. <laughs> Mr. Spitzer. You know, I, I, Come on, I, I'm, I'm, I am not going to drive your viewers off the TV, <laughs> but I'll tell you what it is. Land of Hope and Dreams by Bruce. And you don't want to even sing a I, little bit? You know, you know what? I, Scott and I are a rare instance of <laughs> unity between us. We think we have unique talents in some areas. Singing simply How about like I'm representing it together. We'll do a duet. We'll, 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 Marcia, we'll do a duet next time we're together. Okay. How's that? All right, our next question is from Marlene. This question is to both of you. In an attempt to eliminate pension abuse and the legions of people who retire early on disability and then get other jobs, should you audit or investigate the doctors who grant medical disability pensions to city workers? Mr. Spitzer? Absolutely. Look, when, when I was Attorney General, we had a Medicaid fraud unit. We did just that. We tripled, I believe, I'd have to go back to the numbers, I think it was tripled, the state recoveries in terms of fraud being perpetrated in, by those seeking Medicaid dollars. That is precisely what you're talking about. You examine every link in the decision-making process to see where people are gaming the system. Sometimes it's those who apply, sometimes it's those who are making decisions, such as doctors who have to certify that somebody is disabled and may not be. There are kickbacks. We made legions of cases like that. In another context, fake, fake auto accidents, people pretending to be sick when they weren't. Look, people who deserve the funds should get it. Those are the ones we have to care about. Those are the people for whom the system is designed. We want the funds to be there for them. What that means is we have to make sure the funds aren't going to those who are gaming the system. That's what I did as Attorney General. Mrs. Stringer? You know, the, the Comptroller's Office can be a very good point of interest when you look at where public money is going. So there certainly is a role for the controller during audit and investigation. I think the challenge for this office is we have to reimagine it. It's a huge bureaucracy. And quite frankly, it's been kind of the same since Jay Golden was controller. I want to be able to bring in the best and the brightest like I did as borough president. I want people to come into this office and believe again that government can mean something. If you're out there auditing Medicaid fraud, if you're going and challenging uh, why people are getting ripped off, there's a sense of purpose to the mission. And I believe that I have the skill set, the enthusiasm, the ability to attract people back into government, into this office, so that we could be a strong counterweight to the mayor, we can hold agencies accountable, we can take on the technology contracts, the way I blew the whistle at the Department of Education on these $900 million outside consulting fees. It's going to take a controller who has a leadership skill to do exactly what I did as borough president. I'm excited about the challenge because every dollar we save our taxpayers that's another school we can build. That's another cop on the street. But it's going to take revitalizing that office, energizing that office, getting it out of the web of bureaucracy okay, and into the streets up, of the Stringer. city. 
Mr. Spitzer, did you want to rebut that? Well, only I applaud and totally agree with the concept of revitalizing the notion, but I did it as Attorney General. And I think if people look at one office that was transformed, one office that actually embraced a new mission, one office that redefined its purpose, it was the Attorney General's office when I was there, which is why we confronted Wall Street, protected low-wage workers, extended protection for women seeking health care, protected the environment, protected young students who were being exposed to diesel engines that were idling outside their schools. Cases big and small, some that got lots of attention, some that got none. I did it in the Attorney General's office. That's what I will do for the Controller's office. Next question from Rich Lamb. This is for both of you, and it presents a great opportunity, I think. For the better part of this campaign, you've been hurling insults at one another. Is there something nice you can say about your opponent? And Mr. Spitzer, you have the first opportunity. For first, I, I, I hate to disagree with you, but <laughs> you know, I don't think we've been hurling insults. So this is, politics sometimes can get a little ugly. No question about it. Scott and I like each other. We, we get along. And, and I think whatever is said in, in this campaign, I hope afterwards we will be the friends that we were beforehand. I'm going to say something very nice about him. I'm glad he got the first question about needing to sing, and he didn't, because that way it was easier for me not to sing. And I look forward to joining him in a duet and a drink at some point. <laughs> Uh, you know, Rich, actually, part of the political discourse is about comparing and contrasting record. And it was never, ever my intention or Elliot's to do, to say anything is personal between us. Uh, we've been friends before this campaign. We're going to be friends after this campaign. This is our democracy. The fact that we're here today debating and tussling speaks to the fact that we both want, uh, we both want this job and we both want to get our uh, voices out there, and uh, we definitely are going to hang out after this, that, that I promise you. He's going to help babysit my uh, two kids. who will come over, and uh, we'll, have, we'll have that drink. Glad you trust me for that. I do. I do. OK, the next question is for Mr. Stringer. You were once a partner in a bar called Uptown Local, which went bankrupt and, according to published reports, had left a number of creditors. I wonder how that experience prepared you to be controller of the city of New York. Well, it prepared me to be a public official concerned about small business. You know, 24 years ago, I wanted to take a shot with some friends and see if we could run a small business. It's very difficult. It was hard 24 years ago. And I have to tell you something, it's even harder today. So many businesses open up and are closed in six months to a year. It's tough when you have to deal with a, with a landlord who is ready for the next person to come into the space. It's tough dealing with the issues of taxes and fees and all the issues that you have to struggle with. So I learned at a young age how difficult it can be. The question now is, how do I use that experience to make a difference for the people in the city? And part of what we've talked about in my office is figuring out how we take our great small businesses, especially those in the service sector economy, and how we can market them internationally. We've got to take our small businesses on the road because they are branding the greatest city in the world. Businesses in Brooklyn and Staten Island, these are businesses that we can help by expanding their reach. And you know what we found in our study? We found that if you can expand a business beyond the borders of New York City, you're actually going to grow jobs in New York City. So that's something that I hope we're going to be able to do if I'm controller. I just wondered if it gave you a greater sensitivity to small businesses who come, who might come to the controller's office and say, we can't afford to pay our bills, we went bankrupt, we made bad business decisions, and that would make you more forgiving, less forgiving? Well, one of the programs that, I, that we worked on was to do micro lending to small businesses so they wouldn't be in that situation where they couldn't pay the rent or they were on their way to bankruptcy. We created a, a program with Axion New York, uh, which is a Latino organization that was able to do advertising about micro lending to help small businesses under some very difficult times. You know, a loan during a critical three month period is the difference between a business going out or staying in. When we announced that loan program, and we didn't get a lot of attention, the only the Latino media came to Your join us. Up, Mr. You know what happened? Yeah. The phones were flooded. Small businesses wanted to engage and get the help they needed. Mr. Spitzer. Well, I'd only respond by this and, and, and playing off and not playing, relying upon what Scott said a few moments ago about compare and contrast. My dad created a small business, started it. We worked hard. It's been a family business. I've been proud to be part of it. It has grown. It has prospered. Running a business, knowing how to run a business, knowing how to manage risk, knowing how to pay bills, pay creditors, meet a payroll, generate wealth and jobs in the city is something we've proven we know how to do. The consequence of that, at least in part, is the foundation that my opponent wants to malign, but has generated over $30 million in grants to great cultural institutions in the city just over the past couple of years. I'm proud of that record in business, 
in the private sector. People may know more about what my family or I have done as Attorney General and Governor, but I'm equally proud of what we did in the private sector and the business my dad built. Next question from Rich Lamb. And this has to do with the city budget. In what particular area of the city budget do you consider yourself an expert? Uh, Mr. Stringer, we'll start with you. Well, as a state assemblyman, I was part of 13 budgets, so I know the rough and tumble of, of making sure that the priorities for people are met. Uh, as borough president, I can tell you that my uh, investigations of the buildings department, uh, my idea for how to create uh, 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 agencies that actually do the people's business, that is where my skill set is. I've worked with NYCHA, I've worked with the Department of Buildings. I would say that every agency I've examined top to bottom in some way or form over the last seven and a half years as borough president. The Department of Education is another example where we were not auditors, I'm not the controller, but we were able to issue reports identifying waste in spending I, and advocating for more classroom uh, resources so that we can better educate our kids. When I become controller on day one, I will have a full understanding of every city agency because I've worked with those agencies for quite some time trying to get results and challenging them when they've done the wrong thing. Mr. Spitzer? Well, again, as the governor, we worked integrally with the city, funding the city. A significant portion of the city's budget is transfer payments from both the state government and the federal government. In particular, I would say that we increased, and I'm very proud of this, we increased the city's education funding by $1.76 billion. That had a huge impact on the city, on the classroom, on parents, on kids, teachers. And we did that by doing something that people didn't think could be done. We broke what was called shares up in Albany, the old-fashioned, ossified way of allocating money upon a rigid allocation across the state that was cheating New York City out of credit and money that it needed. Those dollars, the $1.76 billion, have made a huge difference in the educational infrastructure of the city. So I would say to the extent that we worked very closely with the mayor, with the Commissioner of Education to get those funds to the schools. We crafted something we called Contracts for Excellence to make sure the dollars went where they were supposed to go, that the dollars were going to get into the classroom. Those were things we did. And again, I don't want to claim an expertise in the city's budget. I was the governor. The city was a different municipality, different political entity. But we worked very hard, hand in glove, with the city to make sure the dollars went where they were supposed to go. The next question is for Mr. Spitzer. Since you're so wealthy, I wonder if you might serve as controller if you were to win for a dollar a year like Mr. Mayor Bloomberg. I, I, I'm hesitating because, look, my tax returns have been public and I paid 49% of my income last year in taxes. I'm proud to do it. So wealthy is a slightly elastic term. Yes, I'm very comfortable. I do very well. I don't want anybody to think I'm Mike Bloomberg. I'm not. I applaud the way he has created his company and his wealth. But I think there are a significant number of zeros between him and me. And so I want folks to answer that. In answer directly to your question, will I serve for $1 a year? Yes. You will? Yes, ma'am. After that whole thing, you're going to say yes? <laughs> <laughs> you thought I was building you up to say no? Look, I want to serve. I'm proud to be a citizen. I'm successful enough and comfortable enough. I will serve for $1. But I will collect the $1. And paid 49% And taxes. paid 49% of it to taxes, no doubt, indeed. OK, you both, you both see the job, seem to see the job as a stepping stone to so another why, Marshall, office. why didn't you ask me if I'm going to serve it? Oh, will you serve it for a dollar a year? I par I, pardon me. Will you serve for a dollar a year, Mr. Stringer? My, my, my wife is listening to this debate. Absolutely not. We have a, I have a 20-month-old son, and I have a 12-week-old son, Miles. And uh, no, I have to have the salary. And, um, but I applaud Elliot. But uh, no, I need the money. Thank you. OK, so we're going to have another lightning round. Um, Mr. Spitzer, have you ever used lights and sirens to get ahead of traffic? No. Mr. Stringer? No. Really? Neither of you? No. Okay. No. In um, fact, Marsha, just so it's clear, I told when I was governor and attorney general, I instructed those who were driving me when I was head of security, I said, do not do it. It is simply not the right way to handle traffic. Next question. What's the average tip you leave on a restaurant check, Mr. Stringer? I'm a very good tipper, depending on the check, but I, I do well. And Mr. Spitzer? Between 20 and 25 percent. What, but what's your per percentage? I, I'm at 20. I don't know if I always can get up to 25, depending on the paycheck. And this what isn't the bidding process, rent, Scott. You know? This is not. <laughs> OK, one more question. Um, we're going to be actually now is the time that we go to closing statements. We'll now give each of our candidates one minute for a closing statement. The order was determined by lot. Mr. Stringer, you are first. I'm running for controller 
because I believe this is a very important office at this moment in history. Think about January 2014. We're going to elect a new mayor, new council speaker, many new council members. The controller must be a steady hand, someone who watches out for the working people of our city, a person who makes sure that the people throughout our city are getting the services to which they are entitled. In order to achieve these goals, I'm going to monitor every city agency. I'm going to put those savings to work for the people of this city. We've got to build out our education infrastructure. We've got to build more affordable housing. We have to make sure that the people who were victimized during Hurricane Sandy, that they get the resources they need. That's why we have the proposal for the Sandy unit. That's why I've talked about ClaimStat, to send more money into the general fund by using new creative ways to in, in deal with the whole new way we're going to approach the controller's office. My wife and I and our two kids, we love being New Yorkers, but we also recognize that all of us feel a little squeezed, a little priced out. We've got to level the playing field. We need one standard of justice in this city, not just one for the rich Mr. and powerful Stringer, and another for the rest up. of us. I would appreciate your support. Mr. Spitzer, your final statement. Thank you, Marsha. I've spent many years working, fighting for the public. It's in my blood. That's what I want to do. Fighting for low-wage workers who weren't being paid, fighting for immigrants who needed a driver's license, fighting against a system on Wall Street that was cheating the public. The effort has been to design a society that is fair, that creates opportunity, that gives opportunity, such as what my dad got that permitted him to be successful. That is what I believe I can do as controller, by making sure not that we just count the money, but that the money counts. As you've heard tonight, I made a mistake, more than one, but I also made a difference. And what I'm asking you, because I'm asking for your vote and your support, is to give me a chance, once again, to fight for you, to stand up on the tough issues, to elect somebody who's independent of the political infrastructure that has not endorsed me because they see me as a threat to an ossified, broken system. I'm asking for your support so I can continue to do what I did as Attorney General, what I did as Governor, to work for you, to fight for you, because I think we can do a great deal if we do this together. Thank you. Well, that concludes tonight's debate. Um, we want to thank Mr. Spitzer and Mr. Stringer for joining us tonight, and to thank you and our panelists, Rich Lamb from WCBS News Radio 88 and El Diario La Prensa's Marlene Peralta. And thank you for joining us. We want to remind you that the primary election is September 10th, and tonight's debate is just one of many that we're hosting this election season. That's it for now. We'd like to say good night, and thank you for joining us. Through its NYC Votes programs, the Campaign Finance Board connects New Yorkers with the information they need to be informed, engaged voters. Along with these debates, the CFB prints the city's official nonpartisan New York City Voter Guide, produces a video voter guide, and has introduced a new mobile platform, nycvotes.org, which makes election and candidate information available right at your fingertips.